Hello everyone and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Ananda Murti, the Jamalpur Years. And this is a reading of the 13th chapter titled Prachar. The fact that the fortune of every individual, not only of this earth, but of the entire cosmos, has been wreathed together will have to be admitted one day by humanity. Spiritual aspirants have to fetch that auspicious moment sooner by their postless effort, service, and propagation of the great ideology. This alone is the supreme task for the present humanity. With the establishment of the new organization, Baba began encouraging his disciples to actively propagate his teachings. He had named the organization Ananda Marga Pracharaka Sangha, or AMPS, the Society for the Propagation of Ananda Marga, using the Sanskrit word Prachar. As the name of the organization implied, Prachar quickly became its main activity. The one restriction was that the master's name or whereabouts could not be disclosed to new initiates until they were given permission to meet him for the first time. The disciples quickly printed up a couple of small pamphlets to help them with their prachar efforts. One contained the ten principles of Yama Niyama. The other introduced the organization and some of its basic tenets. An excerpt from the text of the second leaflet shows their enthusiastic acceptance of Baba's early teachings. We are against man-made, divisive tendencies of all sorts. We firmly believe that all living beings are the children of the Supreme Lord. No one is superior or inferior to anyone else. We belong to one human family, irrespective of our country, religion, color, and community. All are brothers and sisters, and there is one Dharma for all human beings. We are against religious hypocrisy and religious exploitation of all types. We have no faith in so-called Gurudom, Christum, or the philosophy of divine incarnation. We are against religious dogmas, such as animals slaughtered in the name of religion, tyranny over innocence, idol worship, and hereditary authority in religion. We are dead against social, psychic, and religious superstitions and dogmas of all types. To strengthen the foundation of unity, we have to bring humans closer together. We support widow remarriage, intercaste, interstate, and international marriages. We consider wrongs done to widows, child marriage, and the dowry system as heinous social injustices. We believe that ghosts, spiritism, and possession by gods and goddesses are psychic superstitions. In April, Baba asked Chandranath to go to his native village of Gadopur, some 60 kilometers north of Patna, to arrange a Tatwa Saba. Chandranath replied without any hesitation, Certainly, Baba. I just have one question. What is a Tatwa Saba? Baba laughed. A Tatwa Saba is a public meeting or debate on spiritual philosophy. Organize an open discussion with the local pundits and debate the merits of Ananda Marga philosophy versus traditional Hindu ideas. Ask Shiva Shankar, Hari Sadan, and Ram Tanuk to go with you, plus your wife and Ram Tanuk's wife. Once everything is organized, come and see me, and I will prepare you for the debate. The day before they left, the five Acharyas met Baba at his house in Keshavpur. Hari Sadan and Shiva Shankar were deputed to give the opening lectures. Baba dictated the subject matter, which they hastily scribbled down as best they could. He asked Chandranath to answer the pundits' questions and then dictated a list of the questions they would ask along with his answers. The list included, Why do you oppose idol worship? Why don't you accept caste differences? Why do you insist on giving up the sacred thread and the shika? or top knot. He also supplied him with scriptural references to support his answers. The two female acharyas 
were given the duty to go door to door and talk to the village women. Vitally important in an era of strict separation between men and women in traditional village life. On the day of the Tatua Sava, the entire village, young and old, gathered in a mango grove in front of a 12th century temple. The pundits sat separately, formally dressed in turbans, dhotis, and kurtas. Among them were several Sanskrit scholars with somber faces who were capable of speaking and lecturing in Sanskrit. Hari Sadan and Shiva Shankar gave their opening talks. Then Chandranath opened the floor to questions. The most imposing of the pundits, who had been given the title Suvakta, well-spoken, for his scriptural prowess, stood up as a representative. One by one, he asked each of the questions Baba had dictated on the previous day. As Chandranath gave his well-rehearsed answers, the pundit gradually lost his patience, especially when his adversary adroitly quoted passages from the Vedas to support his answers. His final question was, Why do you teach yoga sadhana to family people when it is only for renunciates? Chandranath's answer brought a round of applause from the audience that so incensed the pundit that he started verbally abusing the Margis. He accused them of being atheists and going against the Vedas. One of the most respected elders of the village, Janaka Kumar, a retired school teacher, stood up and confronted the pundit. Pundit Ji, that is enough. We have been listening to you people since our childhood, and you just keep parroting the same thing over and over again, like a bullet going round an oil mill. We're tired of it. We want to listen to what these young men have to say. It's logical and rational. Stop disturbing them. That night, the five Acharyas stayed up late giving initiations. When they were finished, several of the older members of the village came to Chandranath and politely asked him if he would explain to them about Satripu and Ashtapasha, the six enemies and the eight fetters. This was a question for which he was unprepared. It was after midnight, so Chandranath asked him if they could come back in the morning. Once they were gone, he lay down and tried to remember what Baba had said about the subject, but he wasn't able to recall much before he fell asleep. While he was sleeping, he had a dream in which Baba appeared and gave him a detailed explanation of each of the fourteen Astapasha and Satripu, along with the means a spiritual aspirant can adopt to overcome them. In the morning, Chandranath received his guests and repeated what Baba had said in his dream. His visitors went away satisfied. When the five Acharyas returned to Jamalpur, Baba's first question for Chandranath was, So what about Astapasha and Satripu? After this, the Acharya started organizing regular Tatwa Savas in villages and towns near Jamalpur, as well as simple conferences and lectures. On one of these occasions, a weekend lecture was set up at Munger High School, but when the scheduled day arrived, it was discovered that all the available Acharyas were busy elsewhere with other programs. Baba was in the ashram when he was informed of the situation. Sitting next to him was Baban Tiwari, a young police constable. Baba turned to Baban and told him that he would have to give the lecture. Baba, not me, please, Baban said nervously. I have never given a talk before, much less in front of a crowd. I'd be terrified. I only have an eighth grade education. I don't even know the philosophy. I'm just a devotee. Baban, no one else is there. You have to go. But Baba, this is an order, Baban. Repeat your Guru Mantra, and I will take care of the rest. When Baban arrived at the high school auditorium and saw the size of the crowd, his first thought was to slip out the back door and go straight back to Jamalpur. But he found the thought of displeasing Baba 
even more terrifying than the prospect of facing the waiting audience. Better to embarrass myself, he thought, than to face Baba's anger. He had no idea what he would say when he walked up to the podium. But after a few anxious moments, the words started tumbling out. He was surprised to hear that he was actually making sense. His talk received an enthusiastic round of applause, and many people stayed afterward to ask questions about spiritual philosophy and yogic practices. At the same time that Bhavan was giving his talk, Baba was sitting in the ashram with a couple of disciples. Do you know what our Bhavan is doing now? He asked. When Baba told them that he was giving a public lecture in Monger, they found it hard to imagine. Not our Bhavan, they thought, as they looked at one another. Careful not to voice their disbelief. But when Baba proceeded to narrate Bhavan's talk for them, an erudite, lucid explanation of the fundamental principles of Baba's philosophy, they immediately suspected that Baba was playing a game with them. When Baba came to the ashram the next day, they approached him casually. By the way, Bhavan, we heard that you gave a talk last night at Munger High School. Yes, I did, in fact. Would it be by any chance have gone anything like this? They then repeated what they remembered of Baba's narration. Bhavan stared at them in surprise. I didn't see you there. How do you know what I said? Who told you? When they told him that Baba had narrated his talk at the same time that he had been giving it, Baba nodded, as if he had just had a revelation. I see. I had been wondering where all those words came from. After this, Bhavan started giving talks on a regular basis. Once he became an Acharya, he began having great success initiating people after his talks. One day he met Baba on the road. After accepting Bhavan's salutations, Baba asked him to address another public conference. Baba arranged the meeting and a good-sized crowd came to hear him speak. But for the first time, no one took initiation. Afterward, he went to see Baba. Is your vanity now broken? Baba asked him, as soon as he had finished his pranam. Yes, Baba, he replied, carefully examining the floor. But your work is undone. It was necessary. When you went there, you went with the ideation that you are a very wise person and a great spiritual aspirant. Had I allowed you to continue thinking in this way, it would have been your undoing. Such thoughts are not a sign of intelligence, but rather of foolishness. They are harmful. That's why I had to break your vanity. While the Acharya started organizing regular lectures and conferences, most of the prachar was simple word of mouth among the Margi's friends and relatives. Such was the case with Nityananda Mandal, a tall, athletic, young foreman in the brass finishing shop. Nityananda had been living in Hara Prasad Haldar's boarding house for the previous couple of years, along with his cousin, Jiten Mandal. Inspired by Hara Prasad's colorful stories, Jiten had taken initiation late the previous year, followed soon afterward by two other housemates, Hara Gobind and Birunda Bohari. The four of them used to pester Nityananda about the importance of yogic sadhana. Nityananda, they would say, what are you waiting for? The goal of human life is to realize one's spiritual nature and meditation is the key. Only by meditation can you know your true self. Be careful. Life is short. Are you just going to let your life pass you by? Then they would invariably tell him some fantastic story about their omniscient guru and his miraculous powers. 
or wax enthusiastic over some blissful or mystical experience of their own. Okay, if he's really as great as you say he is, then take me to meet him. No, no, you know we can't do that. First you have to take initiation and practice meditation for some time. Then we'll take you to meet him. Anyhow, he's from South India. He only comes to Jamalpur from time to time to give darshan to the initiated disciples. And there the conversation would invariably bog down. Nityananda actually had an avid interest in yoga and meditation. But what he did not tell them was at the age of five, Krishna had appeared to him in a dream in the form of spiritual effulgence and told him, Nothing in this illusory relative world can give you lasting shelter. Surrender to me, the absolute and immutable divine consciousness, and I will guide you across the ocean of samsara to your spiritual goal. Since that moment, he had accepted Krishna as his Ishta Devata and vowed that he would not bow down before any worldly guru, only before Krishna himself. Whenever he would meditate on Krishna, he would start weeping with longing. Torn by his desire to see Krishna physically and the knowledge that this was impossible. One morning in late April, Nityananda was approaching gate number six of the railway workshop when he noticed a handsome regal looking gentleman entering the gate with a tiffin box in one hand and an umbrella in the other. He stopped and stared as the man walked toward the accounts office, marveling at the graceful step and solemn gravity of this unknown figure. Only when the man disappeared through the office door was the spell broken. Just then, he noticed his cousin Jiten passing by on his way to work. Jiten, he said, rushing up to his cousin. Did you see that man who just went into the accounts office? The one holding a tiffin box and an umbrella? Jiten smiled and nodded. Of course. That's Pravat Ranjan Sarkar. The president of Ananda Marga. He enters this gate every day at exactly this time. The next morning, Nityananda arrived early at the gate and waited until he saw Baba passing through. Again he experienced the same sense of fascination. Again he felt unnerved by the extraordinary serenity that seemed to envelop Baba as he walked. As Baba passed Nityananda, he turned his head and looked him directly in the eyes. The young foreman suddenly felt completely unmasked, as if his personal vanity and mental complexes had been laid bare by that one glance. Nityananda lowered his eyes, unable to sustain Baba's gaze. The next day he returned again to the gate and watched Baba pass. That night, he went to Haraprasar and asked him to arrange for his initiation. If the president of Ananda Marga is so attractive, he thought, such an obviously elevated soul, then this Ananda Murti must truly be an extraordinary personality. Come what may, I have to meet him. Haraprasad arranged for him to take initiation the next day from Arun Masumdar, who worked in the same office with Baba. A few days later, they informed him that Anandamurti himself will be visiting Jamalpur on May 6 to conduct a special spiritual program called Dharma Mahachakra. By this time, over a thousand people had been initiated, an exponential leap from the 70 or so disciples that Baba had personally initiated in the six years prior to the founding of Ananda Marga. And several hundred disciples were expected to attend the program. The site arranged for the DMC was the palace of a local Raja, situated on the bank of the Ganges in Monger. Flyers were sent out, announcing the program as the Ananda Purnima DMC, in celebration of the Guru's birthday. Baba arrived at the palace 
just before noon. He was brought directly to his room by a private entrance so that he would not have to pass in front of the thronging disciples. In the meantime, the hundred or so new initiates who were taking part, those who had not yet had their first darshan, were instructed to line up in front of the door to Baba's room for a personal contact with the Master. There, they waited in anxious anticipation, enduring the sweltering May heat, their imagination stoked by the wondrous stories they had heard from the older disciples. Perhaps no one was more anxious than Nityananda, who could not wait for his first darshan of the master of Pravat Ranjan Sarkar, his heart dancing with the thought that he might be about to meet the lord of his many past lives. Once Baba was settled in his room, the word passed like a brush fire through the line that Anandamurti had arrived. Several senior disciples walked up and down the line instructing the newcomers in the proper protocol. Each disciple was instructed to prostrate in front of the master upon entering, to answer any questions he might ask, but to refrain from asking any questions of his own, and then to exit by the side door so the next disciple could enter. Chandranath took up his position by the door and opened it to let the new disciples in, one by one. Shiva Shankar Banerjee stood next to Baba's cot, fanning the master vigorously with a bamboo fan. As the new initiates entered, Baba asked them their name, gave them his blessing, and added a word or two of advice or encouragement. The whole process took no more than a minute or so for each disciple. When it came to Nityananda's turn to enter, he was shocked to see that the man sitting on the cot being fanned by his disciple, was the same Pravat Sarkar. As he stood there, momentarily paralyzed by the realization that he had been deceived, Baba ordered Shiva Shankar and Chandranath to close the doors and windows and remain outside. Before Nityananda could recover from his shock, he found himself alone in the room with Baba. Come here, come here, come closer, Baba said, beckoning him with his hand. Suddenly Nityananda felt afraid. He stood as stiff as a stone idol, his eyes fixed on the floor, wild thoughts racing through his head. Why had he ordered them to close the doors and windows and leave? What does he want with me? Again Baba called him closer. Not knowing what else to do, Nityananda approached the cot, telling himself that he would not prostrate before this man. He would not accept him as his guru. When he drew close, Baba reached out and gave him an affectionate hug. Nityananda started crying profusely. Tears rolled down his cheeks, though he could not understand why. When you were a child, you used to cry for me very often, Baba said. Do you remember? I've been waiting for you. You are going to do great and auspicious work in this world. Be ready. Baba laid his hand on his head. Shiva Mastu, he said. May the blessings of the Lord be with you. Now go. We will talk again soon. Baba called for Chandranath and Shiva Shankar. Before Nityananda realized what was happening, he was out on the lawn with the other disciples. Lunch was about to be served, but he was in no mood to eat. The encounter had left him shaken, but his anger over the deception quickly returned. Who are these people? He asked himself. How can they do such a thing? His first impulse was to leave, but his cousin and Haraprasar caught up with him before he could do so. While he fumed and expressed his frustration, they did their best to justify why they had purposely misled him, patiently trying to convince him to remain for the rest of the program. Finally, he agreed to stay. In the early evening, there was a devotional singing and a collective meditation. At seven o'clock, Baba entered the main hall to give his DMC discourse, a long philosophical dissertation 
on the different levels of existence of both the microcosm and the macrocosm, from matter to the pure, undifferentiated universal consciousness. The last part of his discourse was devoted to the difference between relative truth and supreme truth. Suppose the light waves of the Mahabharata age take another 800 years to reach a certain star. At this time, if one, with the help of a telescope, observes the earth, what will he see? He will see that the Mahabharata has not yet been fought here. For him, it will happen after 800 years. After this period of time, he will see the war of the Mahabharata being waged. What is past for one is present for another and future for the third. All these are relative truths. After exhorting his disciples to realize the absolute truth beyond all relativities, he called Kestopal forward and directed him to sit in full lotus and close his eyes. Baba then ordered Kestopal's Kundalini to rise one by one through the different chakras. When it reached the seventh chakra, Kestopal fell backward, absorbed in the trance of Nirvakalpa Samadhi. Baba pressed his toe to Kestopal's navel point and started asking him questions. There is a lot of propaganda nowadays about Tenzing and Hillary's ascent on Mount Everest. What do you have to say about it? Has Mount Everest been conquered? Prostrate in his trance, his body stiff, his eyes shut tight, Gestopal answered, The Earth's highest peak is an intractable region. It has not been conquered. Go back in time. See the condition of the Earth 3,500 crore years ago. It was extremely hot and inhospitable. Now come forward to 3,500 years ago. What era is in progress? It is the Dwapar Yuga, the age of Shri Krishna. What is Krishna doing? He is walking along the banks of the river Yamuna with a flute in his hand. Is there any similarity between his physical body and his appearance as he is depicted in modern paintings? No. Describe his appearance. Kestopal described his appearance and then recited a Sanskrit verse in a voice so feeble that only the people sitting near him could hear. Navina Megasanivam Sunila Kumala Chavim Suhasa Ranjita Dharam Namami Krishna Sundaram Yashoda Nanda Nandanam Surendra Padavandanam Suvarna Ratna Matnyanam Namami Krishna Sundaram Bhava Dika Karna Dharakaram Bhaya Riti Na Sharakaram Mumuku Mukti Dayakam Namami Krishna Sundaram Salutations to Krishna the Beautiful, who was an object of delight to Mother Yashoda, whose lotus feet are worshipped by the gods, and whose body is adorned with precious gems. Salutations to Krishna, the most reliable helmsman on the ocean of this universe, who removes the fear of annihilation, who grants salvation to aspiring souls. Upon hearing this, Baba entered into Samadhi and fell back on his cot. Nityananda, who had been sitting nearby, climbed up onto the dais and helped Pranay, who was sitting to Baba's right, to adjust Baba's body into a more comfortable position. The moment Nityananda touched Baba, he felt an electric current pass through him, accompanied by a wave of bliss. He saw bright effulgence emanating from Baba's body an experience shared by many others in the audience, and he smelled the sweet fragrance of flowers. For several minutes, he became abnormal. When he came back to his senses, all his hesitation had vanished. He now felt that there was no difference between the Krishna he had adored since childhood and his newfound guru. After some thirty minutes or so, Baba opened his eyes briefly and then shut them again. This happened a couple more times. Then Baba gestured for them to help him sit up. Can someone bring me a cup of hot milk, he asked. One of his disciples ran to the kitchen and returned a couple minutes later with a glass of hot milk. Baba drank it 
and then touched his toe again to Kestopal's navel. Manusia Bawa, he intoned, be a human being. Kestopal opened his eyes. Within a few minutes, he was able to sit up. Baba asked someone to massage him. He also sent someone to bring Kestopal a cup of hot milk. Finally, Baba left the stage and walked slowly to a car that was waiting to bring him back to Jamalpur. Nitinanda ran alongside him, shouting, Parampita Baba Ki Jai! Victory to Baba, the Supreme Father, swept away by the same spiritual wave that had carried off his cousin and Hara Prasar a few years earlier. Thank you.